another any news tower of god cut content this is for episode three kun's past explained and han sung's ex examination i'm kind of scared kun's past explained it feels like any news made these videos not currently but did it after season one was over therefore there were so many like spoiler rich you know screenshots he used you know last episodes am i can I actually get spoiled for Kun's content? I'm not sure, but let's just go with it. According to the writer, Tower of God is a story that uses tests and games to establish a bigger story. Oh my god, the Vietnamese fucking subs are back. No, thank god it's English auto generate. Okay, no Vietnamese, so thank god. Okay. Nothing, I don't hate Vietnamese people. Vietnamese people are great. It's just sometimes any news videos, the subs just lock into Vietnamese, okay? Storyline. And such is the case in episode 3 where a lot of branching plot elements are packed together. Kun's the past. task with the doors was especially indicative of this as it gave us great insight into Kun's past. But as usual, that alongside Yu's character and other minor things could be explained in greater detail. There was also a lot of instant coffee advertisement. Instant coffee is super huge in Korea. That's why it was kind of shown in Tower of God. You could even see Leroro advertising for instant coffee in the waiting lobby. Y'all remember that shit? So let's do as we usually do and continue looking at what the anime changester skipped from the Tower of God webtoon. But first, before we get started... Episode 3. I guess he didn't get a Raid Shadow Legend that this time. All right, this is where he should have done it. You know, this is like anime episodes where I try to guess the opening and sometimes the new opening happens and that's not my fault. That's where it should have happened. I'm always right with the timings, okay? That's not me. That's not my fault. The Correct Door, covering chapter 12 to chapter 16 of the webtoon. We begin with a flashback that gives us our first look into Kun Agno's past. Kun is the actual family name, right? Agero Agnes. I think Agero is actually his first name. Maybe Agnes is middle name. Kun is last name is what I'm understanding. Because the Kun family, they threw him out because Maria, who was Kun's sister, maybe not direct blood-related sister, but one of like a cousin's, right? She seduced Kun apparently, and then she became Zahad Princess, while, while you know, Kun's actual sister was not able to get the favor of Zahad. Therefore, their family was like kicked out of the Kun family gates, right? Something that could have been a little bit confusing given that they were referencing multiple different characters and key events in such a short period of time. Kun Edwan, Kun Agnes, Maria, older sister, the selection Kun's bit- Oh Jesus Christ, there's so many Kun's, man. The gist of it was that Kun unknowingly betrayed his branch of the family, all while getting betrayed himself. You see, the Kun family as a whole is made up of several different branches. Basically, like, Rudy is a grey rat, right? The grey rat family, there's many different grey rats, right? Each branch being attributed to a different wife of the main head. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Branch being attributed to a different wife. <laughs> wife A, wife B. I mean, I, yeah, that's how that works, right? You have, like, the main wife who's, like, wife A, and then everyone else is, like... It's not a concubine because I guess they did become wives, but it's like a harem. The, the main family head, the Kun daddy, has like multiple wives and they, they just roll like that, man. Wife of the main head, Kun Agano's father. Now, Kun was expected to assist the Agnes branch by helping his full biological sister become a princess of Zahad. Yeah, but he didn't and he instead went with Maria. Why? Because he got seduced. An affair over which he had great influence. It was something that needed to be done in order for the Agnes branch to succeed. Now, how does it make sense that a little boy like him is the deciding factor of whether or not a sister becomes a princess? Now, Kun is extremely smart. You can just tell that he's just so conniving schemer. Strategist, maybe? I don't know. He seems extremely intelligent. So maybe it's not that too far-fetched that a little kid back then is able to offer that much assistance for his sister to become a princess of Zahad. I don't even know the requirements to become one. But one day he was approached by his half-sister Maria, a daughter from a different branch of the Kun family. Sister from another mother and we gon' fuck her and then she gon' fuck us. Not in a good way though. She displayed all sorts of kindness and selflessness. She made it seem as if she was the one who was most fitting to become a princess of Zahad. 
And it was these displays of compassion that turned Kun against his very own sister. He ended She was just so nice and she was she just had that riz, huh? She just convinced Kun that I am her and your sister's kind of mid. And Kun was like, you right, Marie, I'm gonna help you. Up abandoning her, then chose to manipulate the selection towards Maria's favor. He manipulated the selection? How does a little kid even do that? Inevitably leading to her being chosen as the princess. But as soon as the selection was over, Maria abandoned Kun. No! Not only that, but because his full sister from the Agnes branch didn't become a princess, the branch in its entirety was dismantled and exiled. What the fuck is this? An Amazon sweatshop? Or like the bottom 10% of employees gets cut on every fucking, you know, quarterly, like monthly fucking performance review? Like the Kun family basically just breeds a bunch of children with many wives and it's like, all right, y'all can either become a Zahad princess or get kicked out of the fucking family. That's how he operates the family? Kun is now plagued by the memories of his failures and the nasty rumors that were left behind. And it's through these rumors that we establish an idea of who Kun was before all this. The nasty rumors kind of implies it's just like the immorality of incest, right? He was a very clever individual, but that cleverness also brought forth conceit. Yeah, conceit and also hesitation, right? Wasn't the whole thing of why Kun could not come to an answer, but Rack Wraith Razor. Let's get serious. Is Mr. Rack Wraith Razor's IQ higher than Kun? Hell no. Rack's IQ is in the single digits, but that's not the point. The point of that test was to kind of judge just by intuition or instinct, can you make a, dis like a decisive decision, right? And Kun couldn't because he was too in his head due to the things that happened in the past. Rack kind of got lucky, but he was able to make a decisive decision. And then there's Shibisu. Then there's monsters like Shibisu, where he's able to just fully understand the whole rules of the game and pass while explaining to the proctor of, oh, so this is what this floor is about. Guys, a monster has arrived. Those around him felt that Kun acted as if he knew everything. Who knows whether it was out of something like fear or envy, but they couldn't even bear to look him in the eyes. This could have all just been an act, though. A mask that he was putting on so that he could fulfill his duty to the Agnes branch. Hmm. As SIU has pointed out in the past, Kun may very well be SIU or Su is, is the author of this, right? Yeah. Be the most human out of the three main characters. Though he tends to act all tough, in actuality he is What did he just say? What did Annie just say? Kun may very well be the most human out of the three main characters. Rack is a goddamn alligator of God. What you got, and then the other competition is a fucking a dog that came out of a rubble and thinks Rachel is his fucking mom. Of course he's the only human, goddamn. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But, you know, it's just, Kun is the only human. Of the thing, and I see an alligator in the fucking middle. <laughs> Though he tends to act all tough, in actuality, he is very sensitive. That was likely the part of him that Maria was able to take advantage of. Mm. Kun had one job and he let himself be deceived out of fulfilling it. And then that's why in the backstory, the mom's voice was like, don't trust them hoes no more. Always think, always scheme, always read between the lines, never simp. It's what brings him down this path of loneliness that Bomb now finds him on. Now, when we switch back over to the examination room. And the very interesting with Kun's past and Bomb is like the eyes, right? There was a lot of parallels between how Kun and Maria's relationship made Kun look at Maria like that, and how Bam looked at Rachel, and why he has eyes like that. So, it already feels like the story is going to a point where Rachel may be like an antagonist. At the very least, not a comrade. At least not yet. I don't know. But everything the anime has done makes it feel like She's already abandoned us. She doesn't want us to find us, right? I just feel like she's not a good person. And if Kun is having a flashback of a past that really resonates with what Bam is going through, don't you think that Kun will try everything he can so that the repeat incident with Maria doesn't happen again? So that Maria in this context for Bam is Rachel. So basically, Bam is a simp. And Kuhn is an incel. Right? Am I wrong?
I, I don't think I'm wrong. We see Bomb learn the true nature of the sky. What he was seeing was nothing more than an imitation created by Shinsu. And the moon that came out at night was simply a manufactured ball They're of light. They're all fake. Neither the sky nor the stars actually existed within the tower. In fact, Kun honestly didn't think that they existed at all. To him, the only thing at the top of the tower was the roof. Now, the test that they were in line for had already been going on for some time now. Kun was already analyzing the situation long before Mr. Neon Bag had even entered the scene. The fucking neon plastic bag or something, the insult. I always love how Kun and Bum always like, like sits on rack, and rack is like a chair, like the kind of furniture. But this guy was like a hired person from Yu Han Song, right? Wasn't this guy intentionally going off, kind of give off tips in here and maybe aggravate Kun? He noticed that only three out of the ten teams before him had passed the test, assuming that the screams of death meant failure anyway. This was later confirmed by Mr. Neon Bag, who had a bit more reasoning behind his claims of time being the key factor. Five minutes. You see, the screams were the only noise being heard from inside the test room. And he gave us the actual answer, right? He was like, hey, I feel like people, you know, they don't pass after five minutes. So, like, try to make a decision before five minutes. He was fucking on point. But there's no way we could have just taken his advice face value. If the administrators truly intended for everything regarding the test to be hidden, then he would have prevented the other teams from hearing the screams as well. This fact alone made the screams itself a clue. It's all and intentional. the logic behind that hypothesis was reasonable enough for even Kun to accept. <laughs> this art, bro. <laughs> it looks like Kun is thinking. But like, I don't know, he just looks so fucking derpy in the early days of Tower of God. What is that haircut, bro? Like in the anime, it looks fucking great. What is my man? Who is his barber? But being a test case for Mr. Neon Bag wasn't something that he was planning on doing. Though he didn't overreact and try to kill him like we saw in the anime. Oh, that was anime specific. But Mr. Neon Plastic Bag also made a direct personal jab at Kun's past with Maria, right? Mr. Neon Bag didn't even bring up anything about Kun's past. But the anime did, because obviously the anime wants to really get the audience to know about everything going on, and the web 2 might take its time and do a little more details later. Kun simply left when it was their turn to go and do the test. Interesting. The conditions of which were pretty much as we saw. Take longer than 10 minutes and fail, or open the wrong door and die. Kun act- but opened the, any door and passed. Actively sought a logical answer to the problem in front of him. He rigorously searched for any sign of a hint that he could use. But the thing about this test was that the hint was already given. Kun just chose not to trust the person giving it. And that's like the curse of his past. Don't trust anyone. Never trust them hoes. Always read between the lines, but he couldn't read between the lines. There was hesitation there. It was a lesson that you wanted to teach Kun directly. <laughs> Why does Yuhan Zung see Kun as someone so special where he's personally getting involved? Because I guess, well, I mean, if Kun's family already has a princess of Zahad, I don't know how the system works here, but you know in Mahoka, there's like the 10 clans, right? Big families, right? The big houses, big family names. Maybe Kun's system is something like that, right? I understand that this is an administrator, but to understand each personal candidate and to give that much advice to everybody equally, I don't think so. But if Kun had some kind of clout because of his family name recognition, if there is such a thing, then I could totally see it. He knew Kun's past would cause the hint to serve as a detriment instead of an asset. As he was now, Kun only acted when he was certain of the outcome. This test created a situation where that certainty wasn't there. Unless all the hints were taken into consideration, a leap of faith needed to be had. And that's exactly where Kun fails to act. That's where Rack comes in. This a fact that the test served to highlight. That, as well as the importance of having teammates. <laughs> it's after this that Fuck, he looks so cool. Fuck, he is the main character of this show. It's after this that we get to see a lot of the other teams take the test, giving us a bunch of different perspectives on how it could be approached. First, we had Concho's group. Much like Kun, Concho d Concho? Uh, I don't really remember Concho, to be honest, but I do remember this guy, because he was like the fanatical religious guy who's like, oh, this is God's way, this is the path, right? He was kind of interesting like that. Much like Kun, 
Kancho didn't believe he had all the clues at his disposal. That's when Chopin says that he'll use the prophecy of God to find the right- Bro's name is Chopin? Chopin? Like the pianist? It's door. Supposedly, this was one of his personal abilities where he connects to his god and receives divine instruction. Schizo or real? He actually has his own god? Or is he just high off of something and he just having a schizo delusion he got lucky here? I... What do you mean god? I mean, it's Tower of God. Maybe he's the one person that actually has connections with... The god of the tower, guys. I don't know, I'm gonna say schizo. Of course, it wasn't actually that. All Chopin really did was make a wild guess based on unfounded faith. Next was <laughs> Hose Group. I feel like there's a little bit of meta-commentary here on what Chopin did, how he got success, but he made a wild gaze on an unfounded theory and it just worked out. And people are gonna say, oh my god, he's the messiah. Lisan al Gaib. He did it, bro. He just knows. He just fucking knows, bro. That's the, the scary thing of religion and stuff like that, right? Where, you know, if you have a charismatic person and he starts talking all this shit and some of the things align, people will just believe anything, even though it's not grounded in reality, because something like this might have happened and people will be like, oh, Lisan al Gaib. Next was Ho's group. Lore was sleeping as usual, which, as you'd expect, Giga pissed Chad. off Serena. Even though they were in the middle of the test, all Lore wanted to do was just continue to sleep. But Giga because Chad. Serena was complaining so loudly, he couldn't. His initial response was to just <laughs> open Crying? the door. The thought process being that because no hints were given, it didn't matter which door was opened. True. To him, every door offered an equal chance of success. I mean, he's not... He's not wrong about that, right? Maybe, assuming that there, if there is no hints given, if there's truly no hints, which we know is kind of a lie, because Shibisu did, you know, kind of point out the hints. The five minute cap with the voice screaming, the fact that the time clock was from one to 10, but something about it was like perfectly in intervals of a specific amount of minutes that clued that you gotta do this in five minutes, right? Shibisu had that shit figured out, but if you did actually have no hints, then you know what? Sometimes it's just like, fuck it, let RNG take the wheel. He then called Serena an old lady, which, as you'd expect, Boomer. she didn't take it very well. So after beating him up a bit, she took his blanket and- Is Serena stronger than she- Lore? Nah, Lore's built different, right? I mean, if the dude is sleeping the entire time and still passing every test, I don't- I think he's a fucking god, bro. Hello hostage and told him to solve the test. Of course, this was extremely annoying to Lore. He just wanted to get the test over as quickly as possible. She was gonna so cut that go shit up. To sleep. So what he did was just open the door that was closest to him, Easy. passing the test without any thinking involved whatsoever. The last team that we got to see was Shibis. The best fucking team, bro. We have on the left, who I'm assuming is a princess of Zahad, and on the right, some kind of sword master. But those two can't function. Without the middle leader, bro, she be Sue. And his was the only one that approached the test perfectly. <laughs> perfectly. See, Shibisu took all the three hands perfectly he was and came to the only logical conclusion. The screams, the clock, and the fact that there were no hints all dictated that a door needed to be opened within five minutes. Too good. And that was something that Shibisu alone. Yo, even in this shitty art, bro, look at him. Look at that look of confidence, bro. He is him. That's a fucking main character panel, bro. If only we could work on the drip and the haircut a little bit more, because he kind of still looks like a background jobber. But in my opinion, the fact that he looks like a background jobber NPC character makes it even funnier when he pops off like this. Figured out. He finally proved that he could be somewhat useful to his team. Now, after See, even like, you know, they acknowledge him. He is useful sometimes. You don't love that. I'm not sure what Anak is saying there. Now, after all the regulars were- And like, people- And people compared Shibisu and Kun as like, Kun is more like, schemer? Strategist? But Shibisu is more of like, problem solver? Puzzles. Kind of stuff like that? And I said a couple episodes ago, uh, where characters, like, um, the type of characters I really enjoy in anime, like the archetypes, are like King from One Punch Man, Buggy D Clown, or Usopp, right? God, Usopp from One Piece. These characters where they seemingly are fucking nothing, but 
just somehow with sheer luck, they're godlike, right? Shibisu's not really like that. Shibisu is like a Shikamaru from Naruto. That was a great comparison someone made in the YouTube videos. Shibisu doesn't get lucky. Like, Shibisu is straight up giga brain, super fucking smart, maybe even like leadership strategist kind of thing, and perhaps the only person that could like rival Kun's level of intelligence. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here, and we haven't seen other Giga Brain characters, but Kun and Shibisu definitely stands up of all rest in terms of like pure intelligence. Shibisu alone figured out. He finally proved that he could be somewhat useful to his team. Now, after all the regulars were tested, we have a scene where Yu explains why he had Mr. Neon Bag give out the hints. The reason was because of the different effects that it would have on different minded people. Mm, the hints itself, even though it gave you the answer, it might actually end up backfiring. Almost failed because of his innate distrust in others. Had he not received the hint from Mr. Neon Bag, then he probably would have been able to figure out the answer on his own. Who's gonna save Kun from his uh, trust issues? Pom? Is this gay ass relationship gonna fucking open him up? His bussy ain't you know, the, the only thing that's gonna be opened up. On the contrary, Shibis Kun would definitely be the bottom and Pom would be the top. It would definitely be something like that, bro. It's like you got like the innocent, calm, timid kid, you know, who should be like submissive but actually is packing. And then you got like the, the tsundere cold, you know, edgy type, but it's, it's actually soft, you know, some bottom or some shit. I could totally see that. Shibisu took all the hints into consideration and formed a reasonable conclusion based on yeah. evidence. Chopin decided to rest his group's fate on his false faith, and Lore used his annoyed state of mind to come to a quick solution. Clearly the hint had a different effect on all. It was something that you liked to compare to a cup of tea. To some, the tea was medicinal, but to others it turned out to be poison. And okay. even if that tea was in fact intended to be medicinal for all, the Technically, Annie News, he was drinking instant coffee here. Snow for all. The person who received it still had to choose to drink it. That was the only way to verify that the tea truly was what it was said to be. In the end, it didn't matter whether the hint was useful or not if the person receiving it already decided that they weren't going to use it in the first place. That's why the hints were given to them by Mr. Neon Man. I see. It added that unknown element. It's like plans within plans, bro. All these tests and stuff. This show is pretty big brain. It's like, I'm starting to know, it, even the crown game too, right? There's a lot of rules. It's not just like, all right, go fight. And then, oh, you won. All right, this guy wins. Next. It's like every round, every test, it's very carefully intricate. There's these specific rules that's in place so that no one person can just overpower, you know? Next, we get to when Quant administered the first and second tests to Right, for regulars. Rachel. He was the type of admin that didn't like the boring stuff. So, to make things go by a little bit faster, he initiated a 30 minute survival game to trim out the initial group. And then out three of the people left. Out regulars participating, only three of them were left at the end. A team of which we learn that Quant finds out consists of both an irregular and a princess of Zahad. That's why Anaka and that girl was looking at each other, huh? That's why Anaka and that girl was looking at each other, huh? Should we stop? It's not too much of a spoiler. There were definitely some interest from that girl in the hood looking at Anak the entire time, right? This is kind of a spoiler, though. Oh, am I going to get more spoiled if I keep watching this? Am I? He even mentions Ivan Kel here. I'm just looking at some of the pictures here. Like, is it a good idea to do these? Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we should be doing these, like, because, like, I'm really scared. Because, like, apparently there's, there's a lot of, like, big spores up ahead, specifically towards the season finale, right? Like, should we stop? Maybe it's a better idea to do these, like, I don't know. I always wanted to do, like, an episode-by-episode episode comparison so that we're kept up, you know? We do one episode a week, and then now we can do the any news, you know, cut content to further solidify our knowledge. And he does does a great job with that for the recent Mushoku Tensei and Tensura content. 
But this is from a while back, and I'm sure his structure has changed up. And he probably made these after watching all of season one. That's what I am thinking. Uh, should we continue watching this? Uh, fuck, dude. Yeah, we can do any new spoil me title today, but fuck. I... Should we keep watching this? This was quite the precarious situation, because if Quant knew that there was a princess and an irregular, then he shouldn't have carried out the test in the first place. Quant was supposed to check the background of each of the- Well... It's not- This is cut content. But the anime is obviously hiding the fact the other hooded girl is a Zahad princess, right? Clearly, the anime is intentionally cutting out Quant and Yuhan Sung's, you know, conversation about the implication that one of them could be a, an irregular and a, and, a, and, a, and a fucking Zahad princess, right? So, he's not really spoiling, right? This is specifically cut content of the webtoon content that was translated. I don't know. I don't know any more, man. Fuck. Candidates. That was standard procedure for the preliminary tests. But since he didn't, it meant that it could lead to a lot of trouble, especially if Evan Kell found out about it. This wasn't a. Okay, Evan Kell. This is Evan Kell's floor. We still haven't met him. I thought the. Well. Yuhan Song is the admin of the exams, but is he the admin of this floor? No, right? Evan Kell is the admin of this floor, right? A situation that someone as strict as her would easily dismiss. That's why Quant was begging you to come up with a plan. Now, although you seemed as if he was angry, that may have just been a facade. You see, later that day, you was laying in bed, putting on a kind of mischievous grin. You Almost was as laying if in this bed. This whole situation was something that he had planned from the beginning. That was the kind of face that he was showing here. Yo, any other character, like if you didn't have these like armored, like these like defined like pecs here, like this is like woman, bro. <laughs> There's so many androgynous characters in here. God damn, you Hans, like we, you looking, you looking kind of nice. I'm not gonna lie. We then switch over to the waiting room of the next test. There were just- That's a whole ass gimp suit. This guy is a whole ass fucking gimp suit. What in the fuck? Just over 20 teams left from the previous one. So only There's about the 60 to 70 regulars remained. It's here that we see Kun leave to go to the washroom while Shibisu introduces himself to Bum. Their conversation leads to the topic of their motivations for climbing the tower. We learned that Shibisu promised a close friend that he would make it to the top, whereas Bomb just mentioned how he needed to find someone. Shibisu has a close friend? Did he mention that? I thought that Shibisu basically went to Bomb and said, Hey, let me get you this drink, little guy. Yeah, it inspires me that you're still here. Because you look like a fodder, just like me. And it's like, if you can do it, I can do it. Yeah, let's fucking go. But he did it to... It's like a promise made to a friend? The thing is, with no clue as to where this person was, Shibisu felt that this goal may be a bit extreme. Wait, 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 is it a girl? Wait. Topic of their motivations for climbing the tower. We learn that Shibisu promised a close friend that he would make it to close the top. Close friend. Whereas a close friend to make it to the top. Are they already at the top or are they also going to go to the top later? Bomb just mentioned how he needed to find someone. The thing is, with no clue as to where this person was, Shibisu felt that this goal may be a bit extreme. Well, she's about to show up next episode. He understood that the inner tower was far too huge to track down a single- Zahad Princess? You think that Shibisu's childhood friend is a Zahad Princess? Nah, you need to think bigger. Bigger! The childhood friend was a Zahad King. Go person. It was a concept that an outsider like Bam couldn't quite fathom yet. So, when Shibisu made it seem as if Bam's goal was out of reach, his words didn't go so far as to dishearten him, but instead motivate him more. Bam made it clear that he intended to find Rachel no matter what. It was a level of determination that Shibisu knew that he had just insulted. So, rather than leave him with the pessimistic words he just said, he instead gave an apology and left with a few words of encouragement. Good guy. The next scene that we get into begins the crown. <laughs> Shibisu briefly interacting with a side character NPC and giving him some inspiration saying, You know what? Keep your head up, little bro. You can find her one day. And he continues with his main story because he is the protagonist of this show. An apology and left with a few words of encouragement. The next scene that we get into begins the crown game. A more complex version of King of the Hill. 
It's interesting to note that the way the participating teams were brought to this area was through what's pretty much teleportation. Lenador refers to it as being transmitted. It's how the teams are removed from their rooms and placed into the game when they push the button. Now, Mushoku Tensei, teleportation mechanics is really important, but I'm sure it's like a trivial thing in Tower of God, right? So, instant teleportation seems to be a concept that exists in this world. I guess it does. Now, for those of you who didn't quite understand how to win the game, there's a few key rules that need to be noted. Just have the crown on! Stay on top of the fucking chair until the game ends! Easy! The first is that the game is five rounds. Each round is ten minutes and only five teams can participate at a time. The primary objective for each team was to steal the crown. Once a team has it in their possession, they then have to choose a member to wear it and sit on the throne. At which point the round is immediately over and that team wins. This that same was so team cute. then moves on to the next round where four new teams can participate and fight for the position on the throne. The catch is that once the crown wearer sits on the throne, they can't leave. I, is Shibisu gonna have to fight for himself this coming episode today, bro? Cause like, Anak was like, nah. I wanna stay here, fuck you. But then she did do the crazy whip thing so that no one could, you know, come close to her. But it's like, I wanna see Shibisu fight. I haven't seen him fight just yet. He's been big braining everything so far, but like, bro has been pulling off like fucking Bruce Lee martial arts sounds. So like, maybe he's an actual martial artist god. Like, how crazy would it be if it's like memed upon that, oh, you know, he did this, you know, funny ass stereotypical martial arts sounds, but like, he actually was like a martial artist? Nah, no. No way. If that person steps off of it or loses the crown, then their team is eliminated from the test and the round is over. This goes on for five rounds, and the team that has a member wearing the crown on the throne at the end of the fifth round is the winner. Now, the general consensus of the game was very similar. Going into the first round would be far too dangerous. Even the knight and little girl that we briefly see in every episode had the same idea. They're really not focused at all on the anime, even though any news, you know, he, he even told us about these two pairings and the, you know, the cut content. I wonder if they're actually going to become important in the anime. Holding the crown for five rounds straight would be way too difficult. Shibisu's team, on the other hand, thought the opposite. Both Anak and Hats believed that 50 minutes was more than enough time to take on every person in the room. They were like... But Shibisu was like, guys, the optimal strat is not to go early, but to go later when everyone's exhausted, then we can take the crown. But then Anak and Hats is like, why? All you gotta do is win. Just don't lose. What do you mean? Just don't lose! Even though Shibisu figured that the best plan to that guarantee face. success was to go from the fourth round, he knew that his teammates were far too impulsive to just sit still. Yeah. All three of them truly believed that they were the strongest team in the room. So I mean, Anax and her sword? Definitely, I believe it. Um, Hutz? I'm not too sure yet. Hutz, like... He did go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Anak, at least it seemed like, in the beginning of the exam, right? But, like, beyond that, did he really pop off? I haven't really seen, like, a really cool moment from Hats just yet. So, it's not like he didn't expect them to be out there from the first round. I mean, to them, the test didn't even seem that difficult. And the first round really wasn't, as Anak single-handedly took on an entire team. OP. Kancho compared it to being like meeting a creature from a different world. When Chopin attacked her head, it wasn't the impact that hurt his hand, but instead Anak grabbing his arm and crushing it with her grip. Oh, what? But the enemy didn't show us that. Kancho's group really was doubt- Well, I guess it's even more intimidating that the enemy didn't do it this way. That, you know, he fucking- Well, in the anime, it was funny how he punched her and then his hand hurt. But here, it looks very cruel and intimidating. Like, oh my gosh, you could just do that Not with her hand? So, when they tried to completely ignore her and instead go for the crown, they were all hit back by a single swing of her whip. It wasn't a mini cyclone like we saw in the anime. I'm starting to realize that the 13 series, the Zahat Princess Blades, they're all not swords. They're all sword-like, but Black March is an, it's a needle? What is this? Fucking green January? I don't know, it, it's green, it's gotta be green something, right? It's, it's like a it's like a whip is every 13 series like some kind of fucking sword like weapon where you know yeah crowbar <laughs> is there a fucking crowbar too imagine there's a fucking crowbar like an eminence shadow and because it wasn't that Bob didn't see that rachel was in the room across from him he doesn't even realize that rachel is there until much later into the crown game but yeah that's pretty much it for episode three 
Okay. We got to see a bit more into Kun's past and learn a few extra details on characters who may be two cans past. Did you see that? Come more prominent later in the story. Now I'm thinking for next week I might combine episode four and five together. And that's what he's gonna do. So the next any news cut content will be coming in like three weeks or something. But I'm not sure what I should do with these Tower of God any news content. I feel like it's a bit dangerous, bro. Like I feel like it's a bit dangerous to like watch these because even though today's episode like he didn't spoil but there were spoilers because the anime intentionally cut out the conversation between Yu Han Sung and and you know the other guy disclosing who the members of the party was that survived but it is cut content and it's spoilers I don't fucking know I don't fucking know watching after season one I'm not too sure because like you know the the fucking what's it called it, while it's fresh in my mind, I like to revisit these episodes, but maybe we should be like, yeah, one to two episodes ahead or something like that. So I'm not sure next time we're going to make an end news content for Tower of God, but I can promise you we will watch all of these. But I might try to get ahead a little bit so that we don't end up, you know, getting spoiled, especially if there's some big spoilers coming. But guys, please go like this videos, sub to his channels, and I'll see you in the next one.